everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Friendly Critic Podcast. Uh, I've got another guest on, <laughs> which is always fun, featuring my mom, Kate Murphy. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. So we are wanting to, so we ha- we have like a a theme of the episode, but then are also just kind of, we can go wherever we want still, but um, I like to ask about like what my guests, either like what are some of their favorite or most memorable movies slash shows, or like if you have any that are, that were inspirational or influential in your life at whatever point. So do you, do you have any of those? Uh, yeah. Um, I would probably say that my favorite movie, most meaningful, uh, has a lot of ties to my life and my family would be It's a Wonderful Life because I would watch that every year with your dad and we doing that in in high school like I think I can't remember when exactly how old we were when we first started watching that but it was like released on television and they played all the time but we would watch it and um I've so I've literally seen it lots of times and it brings me to tears every time it's just a really good movie I love so much George and Mary Bailey (laughs) yeah that's a classic it is did you watch it outside of Christmas time too? Um, no, I think we mostly stuck to the holidays just because, um, dad's a traditionalist. So I, we, <laughs> I would watch it outside of Christmas time if I had to, but it's just something that we would watch usually on Christmas Eve or right around then. And, um, it's just very special memory that I have of that movie and spending time with him. And then you guys, when you were little, but I don't know if you appreciated it as much as we did. We'd be sad. We'd be ouch, tears rolling down our cheeks, and you and your brother would just kind of be. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, when you go back and watch it now, then it's it hits a little harder <laughs> as an adult. Right. Yes, as an adult, and now as a parent, right? Yeah, it true. really. Yeah, I have to watch it this Christmas. I always, I usually make a point to try and watch it. I don't know if we watched it last, this past Christmas, but definitely one of my favorites, if not the, my favorite Christmas movie, for sure. Yeah. Yes, I really like that one. And then maybe, um, I don't know. I've seen so many movies throughout my lifetime, but Casablanca is probably one of my all-time favorites. That's just a really great Bogart movie and um, just a classic wartime kind of film. Um, And again, Memories with Your Father. So uh, we watched that together in high school as well. He kind of was a film connoisseur at a very young age, and he opened me up into a lot of um, classic film, perhaps that as an 80s teenager, I wouldn't really have watched, but we did that a lot. We would kind of hang out and watch black and white movies. Um, and then more, a little bit more modern film, I would probably say I love The Princess Bride. That's just a great movie, and it makes me laugh, and I know all the lines. And side note, if you've never read the book, you have to read the book. It's even better than the movie. It's really good. Yeah, I didn't know, or I guess... There's the book in the movie, but I guess I didn't think about, like, the real book. Yes, there's a real book. <laughs> and it's hilarious. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about The Princess Bride callback if you've listened to the podcast. <laughs> I think, yeah. I don't know if that was in my, like, my favorite movies episode or just maybe the one with Nat. But, yeah, that one's classic. It is. Very witty and funny lines. Right. Great acting. Unique story, right? Yeah. (laughs) We'll take on the fairy tale, the classic fairy tale. 
for sure. But yeah, our theme that we wanted to talk about for this episode is like mother characters <laughs> with having mom on. Uh, right. Mother figures. And I thought it could be like good or bad. I tried to f- highlight or like look up some that I've seen and thought were memorable. And then I'm sure you have years. So, yeah, definitely. Motherhood, obviously, we all have mothers, right? And, it, uh, <laughs> and they're very uh, formative, right, for us. So, and I feel like sometimes Hollywood blames a lot on the mother. So, <laughs> So it's an interesting, interesting uh, theme, I think. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people, maybe it's, maybe I'm overanalyzing being a millennial, but I I feel like a lot of Gen Z people now on social media are are like really focused on how they grew up and how their parents affected them and like their trauma and stuff. Like people have real trauma but this seems to be like a strong, a little bit too strong on their, like attributing their parents' influence on how they are as a person now. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to see because just thinking about like what, where m- movies that are being made now and in the future, where that'll take for the mom characters. Because yeah, there there's a few that I'll touch on that I think are quote unquote controversial, like as the more that we've society, uh, whatever moves on like year, years go on, you know? So Uh I don't know if that thought made sense, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if it's necessarily a new thing because, you know, Freud and his whole psychoanalytical thing blamed a lot of stuff on on the mother. Um, yeah, and, true. You know, I don't know. They obviously your parents do play a, a huge role in your life, but like you say, you have to take responsibility for your own life, especially once you're an adult. So I feel like, yeah, maybe there was some trauma that definitely shaped you, but you can. Um, hopefully overcome some of those things. And one of my favorite quotes is some, I think it's Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, sometimes my worst things were my best things because it's the hardships and um, the trials and the suffering. And when we overcome those things, then we grow as a person and we have a really compelling story. So sometimes I feel like, you know, if you allow the the hardships of your life, maybe that was your mothering or your lack of a mother. <laughs> Yeah. that shaped you but you could definitely make it something beautiful yeah i and i feel like the best art whether it's music or movies or books comes from artists that have kind of have trouble or like pain i mean everyone does in some aspect you know so so i don't know like it's yeah it's bad in if it is legitimate, but then you can use it to make either cool stuff or like use it for good. Yeah. Right. I, ideally, right. Like use it for a, a good purpose. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of, I don't know, playing the blame game or wallowing in the, in the suffering and you can't move on, then you can definitely make something beautiful from it. So do you want to start with one character? Sure. I was, it was kind of short notice when you told me that I was going to be on the podcast. Yeah, sorry. Crack my memory <clears throat> and just what some of my favorite mother characters have been. And just maybe not necessarily good, like you said, but sometimes just the most compelling. And they can be kind of bad moms too. But I think... Um, well, let's see, one of my, well, we kind of briefly already mentioned It's a Wonderful Life. So Mary Bailey, I really like Mary Bailey as a mother figure. Um, she just, as a wife and mother together, like she just, you know, they live in that crazy old 
broken down house and she has, <laughs> you know, another kid and Mary worked hard and turned the whole house into a home. And she just, I don't know, she rallied the troops and um, supported George and her family and kids. And I think she's, and then, then it was the war, you know, so it was just a really good uh, character of display of courage and endurance and making the best out of a bad situation. I really like her. And then um, on that same kind of vein, I don't know if you've ever heard of the movie Mrs. Miniver. Uh, I don't think so. So, so it, yeah, it was another wartime film that they actually made in like 1942. So the war is going on. Oh, and okay. it, Set in England, um, and William Wyler directs it. Greer Garson is Mrs. Miniver, and she's the the mom character. And um, the her she has a, a grown son that's like in college, but then he joins the RAF. And then she has two littler kids and her husband. And um, her husband, it's just kind of their life during the war when the Germans are bombing them during the air raids and just all the stuff she has to go through. And she's just, it's just a super moving film. And I read some stuff about it a little bit today as I was kind of preparing for this. And I think uh, President Roosevelt had like a section of this speech like printed off in leaflets and they like dropped it over part of Europe. Uh, because it was such a moving speech and um, I don't know it was just she's just a really great character and that's a really good movie yeah I just I pulled it up on IMDB and she won the best actress Oscar for that year oh she okay Drew Garson yeah best actress in a leading role yeah it's really good and she has a, I kind of relate to her a little bit because her son is, you know, like a young man and he goes off to war and then, but then he gets married. Not, I don't know if you're going to watch it. So spoiler alert. <laughs> um, I don't know. Just that whole thing of her with her grown son, their relationship and <clears throat> her relationship with her husband. I don't know. It's just, it's very sweet and tender and I really like it. And she's just, she also has to fight some Nazi guy that's on the loose in their village and. So it's she's tough, and I and she does a really good job. So it's a good film. I recommend it. Yeah, I see. I'll, I'll put that on my watch list. <laughs> <laughs> so with the with his speech, you're saying that was part of the movie? Yeah, or, I, I okay. think. Well, it was a speech like that. The so at, their village gets bombed, and the church part of the church gets bombed. And I remember like, and some of the people in the town had been killed and there's the town's people in the church and the, the vicar uh, is up there at the front and he's like giving a message and he's kind of talking about, you know, why this is happening and suffering that they're going and just trying to encourage them and, and through their grief. And it was a really moving speech. And I think, I don't know, you'll have to Google the, uh, the exact <laughs> I'm pretty sure they copied that speech from the film and like dropped it over Europe, uh, so, you know, that w- over occupied Europe, so people that were there could read it and like they wouldn't lose hope and as a way to just kind of boost morale. Oh wow! Okay, so I know the speech from the movie. The movie, used yeah, in real life. Okay, yeah, that's a cool fact. Um, moving and i think prior to that like america especially the main citizenry had been kind of like isolationist like they don't want to really get involved in the war too much they're trying to not obviously fight um and then that movie was big like and changing people's minds about you know okay we really have to step up and do something if good people Mm -hmm. don't do anything then tyranny reigns so and it just kind of spoke about how you know the the Nazis were destroying the you know the regular life of everybody, so it was good. That's interesting, yeah. Huh. So it came out in forty two, right? But like Pearl Harbor was forty one, right? 
Yeah, December 41. So they had just entered the war. America had just entered the war. So it was added <laughs> motivation. <laughs> right. And it was filmed in America at a sound stage. So even though it was set in England, hmm. but you know, so it wasn't on location, obviously, because they were in the middle of the war. But it was like MGM, I think, at their studio in California. But yeah, yeah, MGM. Teresa Wright got Best Actress in the Supporting Role. Which uh, character is that? She is the young, the love interest for the son. He. And she marrying him. So, yeah, she's good. And they also got best writing screenplay, like all the writers, looks like. Oh, wow. I didn't know it won so many awards. Six just, Oscars. Wow. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah. And Mrs. Miniver, she's a great mom. I love her. Yeah, that's a, a good pick. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, so what's... Do you have one? What's one of yours? Yeah, I was just pulling up my notes. Well, I had one that I had kind of thought about also Natalie mentioned too, but Mrs. Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> list too i put her down i put pride and prejudice down oh mrs bennett she's so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's kind of more the negative side in to be honest yeah i haven't watched the movie as much as like natalie has or read the book but she seems just very worrisome and concerned with kind of like frivolous stuff Somewhat, I mean, part of it's like your concern back in that time, concern for your daughter's like status, right? Like if they're married, and because that's like what you had to do is like get married and you can't really work. So yeah. some of it is, I guess, like valid, but she's like takes it over the top, I think. She does. <laughs> yeah, and they're. Right, she had five daughters, and so their house and lands and everything, like when her husband died, then it would be passed on to the next male heir. Mm -hmm. So she and all her daughters would be, like, kicked out of their house and stuff. So I think that was her big concern. She wanted her daughters to marry well so they would have some place to live. But, yeah, and, well, she her big failing is that she has no sense of humor. Like, she doesn't understand <laughs> jokes and... You know, he teases her relentlessly and she just thinks he's being serious and she suffers with that. And uh, you're right. She's very dramatic and over the top. And she just makes <laughs> want to cringe like when they're at the ball. And oh, yeah, she's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess yeah, I, you see that in the movie. I, I don't know about the book, but when the, the dad or, and the husband is like <laughs> making some remark. And she kind of just looks past it or doesn't acknowledge it. Right. She doesn't. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, not very um, like humble like about her Jane, who she says, that, oh, she's beautiful. And Mr. Bingley's, we expect a proposal anytime, you, you know, just instead mm -hmm. of being modest and, you know, <laughs> not so whatever braggy <laughs> in front of her friends but and then she's yeah. very and then her younger daughters especially kitty like kitty makes mistake after mistake and then yeah brings shame on the family and then yeah i mean she's not she didn't fall too far from the tree as it were yeah but thankfully elizabeth and darcy can pet see past the pride and prejudice right <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you had uh, another one. Yeah, let's see. Um, well, uh, another um, one. I don't know if you've ever heard of this one because this, is, I think, was probably in the 90s, maybe early 90s. It's called The Joy Luck Club. And it's hmm. based on a novel by Amy Tan. And it's about 
um, Chinese mothers and daughters and their relationships. And it's beautifully done, like cinematography. And um, it's just a really compelling story about are there all, there's like five different moms and then their daughters. And it kind of goes, jumps in time from the future or the current time and then to the past. So it talks about the mothers when they were back in China and the hardships and trials they had to go through. And then they all emigrate to the United States and then their daughters are Chinese American. And so they're kind of Westernized a little bit. And then it's their relationship and the struggles that they have. And um, you, the Chinese mothers especially were not very uh, forthcoming about their hardships and trials that they suffered back in their homeland. And so then the daughters maybe don't understand a full concept of who their mother is and what she's gone through. And they just know that they're having conflict with them. Um, mm. It's beautiful and poignant and touching and it's really good. And I think you and Natalie would like it a lot. <laughs> I don't know if it won any Oscars or not, but yeah. I, it was great. <laughs> But I haven't seen it in a while, so I don't I don't remember all of the the plot, but I remember crying in the theater. It was very moving. Yeah. That's I feel like that's a interesting dynamic when you have like different cultures as far as like parenting and, and the like the Chinese culture with their kind of very much valuing honor and you know i'm not i'm not really an expert on all of that but yeah i don't so i don't know if it's kind of like a cultural thing to be more reserved and to not really complain and just kind of push on and you know do your job kind of thing is that shown in the movie yeah pretty much i think um at least for these ladies because they had a lot of hardships to overcome so then I think they just wanted to make everything new and better for their children so they didn't like want to bring up the past or the hardships or talk about it and I think maybe that was kind of handicapping the daughters because then they didn't really understand where they came from and they were longing for some piece of connection that they didn't have so it's kind of an interesting concept because obviously you don't want to burden your children with all of your troubles and trials and sufferings until they're capable of handling things. And, you know, who knows, maybe you don't even need to ever share some stuff, but in some of the stories, especially, I think it will um, help their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You feel like you can connect more to people if they're share some hardships from their own life. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like I admire people that have overcome a lot and I feel like I can learn from them, you know, or maybe seek to know the source of their strengths or what they did to to help them. Or then perhaps if they're, you know, depressed or whatever, you can kind of understand better. You can not be so quick to judge or be weary of their despair you can kind of come alongside them and say gosh I know you went through so much but I kind of feel that with my grandmother um so grandpa Shay's mom uh Mm -hmm. a really really challenging life and I had a really hard time as a girl connecting with her and I I don't know as an adult woman now I feel like I would have liked to maybe talk to her more about her her suffering and that would have helped me understand her better and not been you know so quick to think well she just we just can't connect yeah so now as I'm a grandmother I want to remember those things so I can you know share stuff with my granddaughter yeah that's a good application yeah yeah, that's I I kind of mentioned that in po- other podcast episodes too, but I like movies where you can ha- get an application from it or like at least whether it's good or bad or you learn something about life or like a good lesson. So that yeah, that seems 
like a another movie like that where maybe it, it like highlights some aspect of life and relationships and then you can kind of yeah use it going forward <laughs> Yeah, I feel like sometimes novels do that a lot for me, but movies too, like you can't always understand either yourself or someone else in your life. And then you see a movie and you're like, oh, this totally makes this clear for me that this person's personality or this human nature, you know, about whatever. And I feel like that's one of the jobs of art, right? To, to just kind of help us hold a mirror up to society and to human nature and to relationship. And it just helps you see better into your own heart and the hearts of those people that you're in a relationship with. Yeah, for sure. Do you have another one? Uh, let's see. Well, to be a little bit different now, a little more, um, fun maybe i don't know i thought of sarah connor from the terminator <laughs> i th i saw that one on the list and i almost put it down but I, I don't think i've seen the terminator what you haven't seen the terminator no failed you as a mother yeah i didn't show you the terminator <laughs> well it was big when i was in uh high school i think so um yes so do you know any of the story of the terminator series yeah kind of just a real high level like he's some cyborg guy that gets sent back in time right from the future right yes so there's uh like the artificial intelligence the machines kind of take over and so then they uh oppress the humans so but there's a rebellion of course and so john connor is the leader of the rebellion and they kind of like i think in the future they win so they beat the machines so then the machines know this so they send arnold's character the terminator back in time to kill john connor's mother sarah connor so mm. he will never be born and so he can never lead the rebellion so this but then obviously the few the humans know this too so they send john sends his own friend back and um, then he meets Sarah and tries to protect her. So it's kind of an interesting story. So Sarah knows all this stuff about the future, like she has to live, her, she's going to have this baby that's going to save the world, yada, yada. Hmm. So kind of interesting. And then like the series of the movies, Sarah just like accepts this huge challenge and she's not scared even though she's obviously a very menacing foe, <laughs> but she is super tough and she just fights <laughs> she knows her child is important so she sacrifices everything and she prepares and it's it's good it's obviously not as deep or serious but um, yeah it, action yeah action lots of action and she's really cool heroine <laughs> linda hamilton is the actress and she in the second one she's super buff and she's got all these muscles and she's really strong <laughs> <laughs> So do they do any, like, so it sounds like there's not any, like, butterfly effect type things where she knows the future, but it doesn't affect the future outcome? Right. I don't think there's any of that. Not that I remember, but again, I haven't seen it in a really long time. But uh, it, there's an interesting twist about who comes back and all that stuff. But uh, it's... I won't spoil it because you really need to see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it because, yeah, I like those futuristic AI movies. I like The Matrix, obviously. So, Right. Well, and now I'm sure the, like the, all the special effects and everything won't be nearly as impressive as as what is possible now. But, you know, back in the day, it was pretty cool. And Sarah Connor was very cool. I liked her. Yeah. I want to like her but i never got him <laughs> <laughs> maybe because i never lifted any weights that might have been the problem <laughs> probably a little <laughs> bit sometimes the old special effects are cooler though like if you think about jurassic park and like what they did for that with the big animatronic dinosaurs and stuff <laughs> yeah and i love the sound effects for those sort of movies like 
you know, when they made the dinosaur roars. Yeah, Very. true. Yeah, that that one is definitely critically acclaimed, and I don't know why I haven't seen it. I should look it up if it's, like, on a streaming platform or something. Yeah, and there's all these classic Arnold lines that I know you know, but you maybe <laughs> yeah. from that movie, like, he says, I'll be back, you know, so... Mm -hmm. That's from the Terminator. <laughs> yeah. Get to the chopper. <laughs> right. <laughs> Arnold's a meme on his own. Uh, yeah. His character in the whole series, the Terminator series, then uh, Arnold evolves too. So first he's the yeah. enemy, but he changes and he protects her. But you'll have to watch to find out. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, no, another like kind of lighter hearted one that I put down was like the mom from the blind side. Have you seen that? Oh, uh, I have seen that one time though. And it was a long ago. I don't remember. I mean, I remember the main plot. I think that was Sandra Bullock, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cause that one was based off a true story where like this mom kind of took the lead for her family to take in this young student. And I don't know if he was like at their school for her kids or something. So that's how they found out about him. But he was like in a kind of a tough home. I think his, his real mom was a drug addict or something like that. Kind of not really the best situation for him to live in. And she took him in and, I don't, he, she might have became his legal guardian, but they, a lot of the story was with football because he's like really good football player and uh, ends up, eventually ends up in the NFL. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool like redemption story. Right. All because of the mom, right? <laughs> yeah. She was the catalyst for like him being adopted essentially i don't know if he was adopted or just cared for at that time but yeah yeah that's a good one i'll have to watch that again yeah so, but this is also one that's i was alluding to with the kind of controversial because like now it can be seen as white saviorism because he was a oh. young black man and she was a white woman obviously so but I don't know. I think it was more, I don't know her personally for her motivation, but I think it was just a good thing to like help somebody out. And I feel like if you were to talk to him, he would say like, I'm glad that they did help me out, you know? Right. Yeah. And obviously it wasn't just talk or, you know, superficial kind of help like if she let him move into their home and she adopted him and you know yeah what gave him skills to advance in life i think yeah that shows that she her care was genuine and it wasn't just trying to look good on the outside right that's where i think a lot of these issues where like if you if you actually talk to people and real life have real conversations and not just be on social media and you see like people what well, some people are either like actually bad or they're actually like trying to be okay <laughs> you know yeah right we shouldn't be quick to judge the motives of others right we can't really see into people's hearts and actions speak louder than words right so and this is a good segue into my next mom because one of my moms on here is the mom, Mrs. Gump from Forrest Gump. Mm. And Forrest always says, mama always says, stupid is as stupid does. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, that's a good that's a good thing to go by, Mrs. Gump. <laughs> what you do is really tells who you are, not just what you say. So, yeah. Another critically acclaimed movie for Yeah. Yep. I remember it well. We were living in 
Coralville at the time. I think it was 1994, maybe. We saw it at the theater. Yeah, yeah it was so good. I really liked it. And Sally Field plays Mrs. Gump, Forrest's mom. And she believes in him, even though he's, you know, his IQ is on the lower side and he struggles with, like, his physical disability of his legs when he was a little boy. And she was a single mom and she had hardships. and But she just you know, gave him support and encouragement. And obviously it was, it worked for Forrest, right? And he was in all those crazy situations. (laughs) But I think it's a nice picture of, of a mom that uh, supported her child and loved him with a, with a deep and true love. And he obviously listened to her because he referred to her frequently. Mama says, life is like chocolates. <laughs> That's true, yeah. I love her quips that she had in there. I mean, Forrest really knew all those catchy phrases that Mrs. Gump had. Yeah, that's. I feel like that one, the mom really had a strong influence, but it's kind of more subtle, like where it's, yeah, because he always has those quotes from her, so it carried on throughout his life. But then, but I like when I think of the movie, I just think more of him because his story was so interesting. Right. But like yeah. his mom was a key influence in his own life. Yeah. Yeah, she was his rock, right? Like she, everything that he was really started from her and her her support and belief in him. So I love that. I think she's a good movie mom. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Underrated one. Yeah. <laughs> I had a uh, another one for uh, Kevin's mom in Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have her in the good mom or the bad mom? <laughs> it's kind of both because. So it's bad that they forgot him, obviously, but right. she was also extremely motivated to like get back and uh, go make sure he's okay, or help right. out, or and gave up on their Christmas holiday plans or whatever they're doing. So right, she She's even in getting back to him. Yeah, she like. <laughs> what's that guy the famous actor but he's the polka guy john candy john candy yeah uh, <laughs> hitches a ride with the polka crew right yes so it's kind of a redemption mom right yeah because <laughs> in the beginning i mean she's making him like pack his bag and he's like eight <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel like that's a lot to ask him to be responsible to get himself packed. He needs help for Pete's sake. And then, like, all, everyone, I don't know. I didn't think he, Kevin was that much of a jerk. But, like, his uncle's mean to him and his yeah. brother, you know, everyone's mean to him. And no one sticks up for Kevin. But <laughs> yeah. But he, he does show that he's resourceful and seems to be as smart for his age so maybe his mom knew that maybe she <laughs> still probably bad parenting though probably bad parenting <laughs> <laughs> do you have another one well let's see i was thinking about a couple different ones um i thought of the movie the sixth sense Mm. Um, one of M. Night Shyamalan's, or however you say his name, yeah. uh, mom um, of the boy. Oh gosh, I can't even think of her name. Her the actress who played him now played her now, but um, yeah, you know, if you remember the plot, there's this little boy, and he has this sixth sense, so he can talk to or see dead people and, you know, kind of get messages or whatever. And so, but he's, like, obviously very troubled. He's super scared of what's happening. And he's kind of bullied, I think, from other kids. And so his mom is played by Tony Collette. It just came. Yeah. Um, 
so she gets Bruce Willis, who's a um, supposedly a, a psychiatrist, to help her son, and she so she's trying to get him help that he needs. But I mean, he's she's obviously very freaked out. So I feel like she's a good, interesting character as the mom. She's like, okay, I mean, <laughs> she's creeped out. I am. <laughs> yeah. Trying not to make him be afraid and stuff. So, do you remember that movie? Did you see that one? Yeah, I've seen that probably one or two times. But... Yeah, so again, I feel like she's kind of a more minor character, but um, I don't know. I liked her. I thought she was a good mom. She was brave in a, in a scary situation, and she tried to get the little dude help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, being confused for uh, confusing child behavior, not right, knowing yeah. where to turn. Because she was like single mom too, right? Was a single mom, yep. And she wants him to just be a normal kid and have friends. And he's weird stuff is happening, and he's always scared. And yeah, and there's <laughs> that kind of spoiler, but that scene where he like she takes him to the birthday party, right? Yeah. And he like gets locked in some cabinet thing and yeah, the other kids think he's weird and stuff. Yeah. Because no one else can see what's going on, so Right. So he's yeah, super troubled. But she still tries to support him and love him as best she can, but I don't know, I'd be freaked out too. <laughs> yeah. But I like the Colette's portrayal. I thought that was her she's an interesting um character and a good actress. For that role. There's also the bad mom in that. For the... <laughs> another spoiler, I guess. It's <laughs> it's 1993, so... Hey, that's an old film. All my things are old, sorry. Or 99, everybody. yeah. But, yeah, the one mom that... Is, like, keeping her daughter sick. Right. The Munchausen by proxy syndrome mom who's poisoning her daughter... Yeah, so that's a good, nice little tie in there, Jack. There's the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One that I do I like to mention, I guess, was the mom from the show Made. So it's a TV show, not a movie, but also thought it was a good one to mention because she's like a a young mom trying to get out of an abusive relationship. So she's like on her own and then there's like multiple dynamics of the mom because she's a mom and then her own mom is like challenging, not exactly mentally stable. And so you kind of see as the season goes on and the episodes go on, like how much she has to struggle like on her own and nobody's helping her. And it's cool to see it. It's like cool to see how she's able to progress, but it's also really sad, like how hard it is. So I thought it was a good like reality check type of show. Yeah, I saw that as well, and I thought that was well done. Andy McDowell, I think, plays the grandmother, and uh, yeah, she did a, a good job of being a bad mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really like the whole, um, you know, sacrificing for your child and because that's, you know, that's a role of parenting. And I feel like you're you have them. They're little for such a short time that it's the right thing to do to um, your needs behind theirs, you know. So Andy McDowell's character put her needs ahead of her daughter. but. Yeah. The main character, she obviously sacrificed to help her daughter. Margaret Qualley is the main character. Uh, yeah, she was good. She th seems like a young, upcoming actress. But yeah, yeah, because she had, uh, she was doing like a terrible cleaning job and stuff, and people were mean, and the employer was mean. And yeah, so it was, she was not, she was definitely 
sacrificing a lot, not living mm-hmm. comfortably like at all. I don't yeah. know. I don't want to spoil too much, but yeah. That's kind of like all I had from the mom's aspect. <laughs> all right. I thought of um, just a couple more that I, that I liked just real quick. The sound of music was a good one because Maria who um, she's not their bio mom, but she comes in to be their governess. And actually, I mean, obviously it's a musical, but it's based on the real Von Trapp family. So that's kind of interesting. And she solves lots of problems with singing. So what better (laughs) mom is there? I feel like I sang lots of songs to you when you were little, much to your dismay probably, but (laughs) No. So she was one of my favorites. And then, um, let's see. Well, this one was, I don't know if it was very popular. I think, I, again, it's probably from the 90s. It had Meryl Streep and Renee Zellweger as a mother and daughter. It's called One True Thing. And um, and I can't remember who the guy is, the dad. William Hurt, maybe? But um, Renee Zellweger is the grown-up daughter, and she's like a career woman journalist. And Meryl Streep is the mom who's like traditional, like homemaker mom. And her husband is like a professor, I think, at a college. And the daughters always really admired the, the dad because he was an English professor or a literature professor of some sort, and she's a writer. So she admired him, and she kind of always didn't really admire the mom for her choices and the mom then gets sick and like with cancer terminal cancer and the dad asks the daughter to come back home and take care of her and the daughter's kind of disgruntled about it because she's got her whole career and you know she doesn't want to come back and but then when she does come back she realizes the the I don't know who her mom really is and what her mom did to shape her life and then the truth about her father you know like maybe she put him up on a pedestal and the mom she kind of unfairly judged for her choices and so it's it was a it was a good story and and i love meryl street no matter what she does so i really liked it and i thought renee zelliger did a good job too but so it's it sounds a little soap opera made opera (laughs) but it's not it's it's well done and it's it's a good story and i think that's it kind of speaks true to life in that you you form these opinions and thoughts about your parents when you're very little and maybe you don't know the whole story. Again, kind of like a similar thing with the Joy Luck Club. Like you maybe have these opinions of your parents, but you were a little kid yourself and you didn't really know everything. So it's always good to see your parents when you're an adult with with new maybe eyes, right? So you kind of take the whole background in and just love everyone better. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think when you become an adult, you kind of mature, right? And then you can look back on your relationships and within your family and, like, realize some of the ways that you're immature. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Cool. That's another one I can put on my list. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to hear your feedback when you guys watch some of these shows. I remember Dad and I watched that together too in the theater. When be it was all before we had kids, so we could watch <laughs> watch a lot of movies and then once you have kids your life changes, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. That one was ninety eight though, so I was around. Oh, you were, you were. It's a date night. Pretty <laughs> small, though. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, then the only thing I wanted to look up, um, because one of my favorite directors, and I know yours too, are the Cohen Brothers. I love the mm. Cohen Brothers. Everything they write and direct is usually so good. And same thing with Quentin Tarantino. So I don't know if you have any Quentin Tarantino mothers, but. Hmm. I thought of the Coen brothers. I thought of a mother. Um, well, she's pregnant at the time, but in Fargo, the Francis McDormand, the cop 
I don't know what her character, but you know, she's the cop that discovers yeah. the body and she's big and pregnant at the time. And so, and she's just, I don't know. I just love her. She's tough. She's, but she still sees like, like the horrible stuff, but then she can say, Oh, well, it's a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> the Minnesota. Yeah. The class Owen brothers, you know, violence and then ordinary, you know, Minnesota life. So, <laughs> Or maybe North Dakota. I don't know. Part of it's in North Dakota, but part of it's in Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a underrated one. Right. She's a she's a good character, and she's a mom, or soon to be one, in that film. And that's really that's really all I thought of. But I did think when I was thinking about Quentin Tarantino, I heard him in an interview, and I know I've told you this story before oh, he yeah. was telling that um his mom was always a big influence in his life and encourager of his writing and every year for mother's day and her birthday he would write her a story because he's obviously very talented but the fun twist with quentin is that usually the mother character died in the stories <laughs> yeah so, uh, you know, that just speaks to who Quentin Tarantino is. But I think his mother probably appreciated that. And obviously she encouraged him to continue writing. So, <laughs> well, and I guess in Kill Bill, hello. Yeah, I just thought the, of that. She's the mom, right? <laughs> she's trying to get her baby back. Main character, yeah. Yeah, she's a good, good mom. She's tough. <laughs> yeah, Tarantino's... Stuff is always like overly violent, but it is, but it's very unique and compelling, that's for sure. True, I'm sure there's many more. Obviously, there's lots of other characters, but these were memorable in my movie going career. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, like, thing to think about, I guess, is like characters that maybe get underlooked or underrated and is like strong influences either on the main character because some of them some of the moms are the main characters but i i feel like most of them are kind of just like the background characters but i think the best movies have like a good supporting cast too right and so like if the mom is a good supporting character then it really completes the movie Right. I feel like when you're younger, you kind of just um, put yourself in the lead character kind of a role. But then as I got to be a certain age, I would always notice the mothers or the older women characters just because that's who I was. And so it is kind of interesting, you know, when you start looking around at the supporting characters because they really make the movie much more dimensional. And I think it's like you said, the influence on the main character, if the mother's not the main character, is is compelling part of the story. So, yeah, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Uh, bring I like having guests on. Brings good insight. It's more fun to have conversation, you know, with the guests and bounce ideas off of someone else. So, appreciate you taking your time to interview with me. Thank you. It was really fun. I had fun talking about movie moms with you.